Good evening and welcome to DAG ladies and gentlemen. It's so wonderful to have you here this evening for this uh, talk that we're all looking forward to with Usha Balakrishnan and uh, Deepthi Sasidharan. Uh, at DAG we often have conversations such as this both on art and art practices but also to try and expand the uh, arena of art itself into multiple disciplines to see where we can cross-pollinate them and to try and understand what was happening uh, either at the periods of times that the art was made or its impact in social and political uh, dimensions. Uh, the Babu and the Bazaar, the, the exhibition on Kalighat Pats and early oil paintings uh, in particular, but also including uh, glass paintings and uh, early printmaking, of course allows us to investigate this uh, to a whole new level because of the investigations into a very vibrant society at a time of great churn, of course in India, but particularly in Bengal uh, that we are concerning ourselves with uh, this evening. Uh, it was a time when uh, the Mughal Empire was in decline, when artists and artisans from uh, the original Mughal centers were migrating towards uh, places where there was fresh or new patronage and the art uh, center that Kolkata or Calcutta became at that time allowed this extension in a manner that is fascinating and is open to discovery uh, even as we talk now with fresh uh, research, fresh scholarship uh, coming in on these periods and I think DAG that way is doing a humongous uh, service in terms of documenting the richness of this uh, art tradition uh, as well as uh, the, the, the milieu or the period or the society or the fresh uh, uh, area of urbanization that was occurring or happening at that period or at that point in time. Uh, the Kalighat Pats of course are works on paper uh, that were intended for pilgrims to take away from uh, the Kali temple uh, in Calcutta. And the early uh, oil Bengal paintings were intended for a more elite patronage. Uh, the idea being uh, that the new houses, the mansions of a largely Indian uh, migrant population that had come into Calcutta was looking for echoes of the Western style of art to place on their walls. So these are the first ever examples or instances of the kind of art that was made in India that was intended to decorate uh, and embellish homes and walls uh, where previously miniature paintings were intended for private consumption through illustrated manuscripts. Uh, tonight's conversation of course is on how the deities and the human beings within these paintings, the Kalikat Pats and the uh, oil paintings, etc., are adorned through attire, through jewelry, how they're made beautiful, uh, reflecting also uh, a sense of both nostalgia already at that time, but also how society itself at that time was consuming these images. And I think for that, we couldn't have chosen better or asked better than Usha Bala Krishnan to share with us uh, her points of view uh, with Deepti Sasi Dharan, both of them experts, art historians, scholars, writers, who've done so much in telling us about uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the jewelry, the clothes, etc., that have defined uh, India over, let's say, the centuries, etc. So I'm going to hand this over to you to take us through this presentation. And of course, we'll have a sh small conversation, uh, post the slides or in between if there are questions, and then finally open it up uh, to the audience for any questions that any of you might have. So thank you and welcome Usha, welcome Deepthi. Should I hand the mic to you? I think we have our label mics. I think that's been recorded. Good evening. It's so nice to see a full house on a Saturday evening. Uh, welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you. My name is Deepti and I'm in conversation today with Dr. Usha Balakrishnan. Both of us have been uh, jewel chasers, her seriously, and me as an uh, uh, enthusiast for a very long time. And um, um, 
congratulations to DAG for opening the show and bringing this here. I saw this in Delhi and uh, it's remarkable that it's here today. Um, there are, as you know, many ways of looking at paintings and uh, um, I was lucky to be part of a conversation earlier in Delhi as well, where we looked at it through yet another window of history and photography and visual documentation. But today I'm absolutely delighted that we are going to be looking at all the beautiful art that surrounds you through the lens of jewelry and attire, uh, which is always uh, amazing because it tells us so much. It tells us about the artists, it tells us about the people who um, uh, they referenced and we are going to plunge into it um, as we look through some visual slides and later, of course, like Kishore said, a conversation. And uh, how do I move and forward? Hopefully it will work. And hopefully it will. This <laughs> to tell us to the next slide. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. I didn't know that. Okay. okay. I have to. It's voice operated like most things. Next slide, please. We are going to be yeah, a little more suspense. We are going to be talking today about art, specifically um, from the uh, from the art that surrounds you, really, in these rooms. But uh, we are going to be talking about 18th and 19th century um, early Bengal art. But as Usha and I began speaking, we were like, let's take early, really early, and we decided to kind of contextualize the milieu in which even this art that you see around you was born. Um, the area of Bengal, what we today know as Bengal, of course, harks back to antiquity. So we decided to go right back to the very beginning to look at some of the earliest examples of uh, material um, objects that actually show jewelry. Usha? Yeah. So the next slide, please. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Kishore and Ditti. Always a pleasure to chat about jewelry. Uh, so yes, I... Uh, instead of starting in the 18th and 19th century, I thought I would set the tone by taking you all back in time. Uh, as a jewelry historian, actually, uh, you know, my journey starts 5,000 years ago in the Indus Valley civilization and, um, you know, comes right up almost to the present. So where did it all start in Bengal? Um, Chandra Ketugar is a site I think uh, probably all of you all have heard about, know about. It was an amazing site, um, terracotta temples. And these are the, some of the things that were discovered in Chandra Ketugar. Uh, these beautiful terracotta plaques. Uh, the one on the right is a comb. But what fascinates me when I look at uh, uh, an object from Chandra Ketugar is the jewelry. Um, and if you look closely, you'll just see how bejeweled the image is. Uh, there's, there's nothing left to the imagination. Whether it's, uh, she doesn't wear a single bangle or a bracelet around her arm, it's stacked, girdles around her waist, anklets, hair ornaments, earrings. I mean, you can just go on and on. Next slide. So I have often wondered when I looked at Chandra Ketu Gar, uh, was this all real or was it just uh, a figment of the artist's imagination? Uh, because after all, very little survives from that period. In actual fact, hardly anything. I mean, there's one earring that is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's called the Kronos Collection. Uh, probably dates to around this time. So what is the time period we are talking about? It's the first century BCE through to about the second century AD. We must remember at this time how important Bengal was. Um, some of you might have heard about uh, Tamluk, uh, the ancient port also known as Tamra Lipti. It was at that time one of the most important ports on the east coast of India. From there, Boats came, I mean, gold and silver bullion was pouring into India and they had trade contacts not only along the coast, along the eastern coast, the Coromandel coast, but also with the Roman Empire at that time. It was also at a time, uh, at the time when boats were going from Tamluk out into Indonesia and that whole region was actually known in the ancient texts as Suvarnabhumi, the land of gold. 
And therefore, one presumes that what you are seeing on these sculptures was crafted from gold, perhaps silver. The bead trade was very vibrant. We know, for example, that beads that were manufactured in the Indus Valley were actually being exported to East India, which is why it became so much in demand and so popular among the Northeastern states. Where did they get those beads from? They all came from uh, places like Khambat, the Rajpipla mines in Rajasthan. So there was a very, very vibrant bead trade and it was known as the Indo-Pacific bead trade. The bead trade actually went from India to Africa and to different parts of the world. So perhaps some of these things that we are seeing, perhaps, you know, the conch, um, shells, beads, gold, silver. Next slide. Again, another uh, terracotta image uh, from Chandra Ketugar. Look closely and you'll just see every single image is beautifully adorned. It is a veritable encyclopedia of jewelry design at that time. Very, very sadly, none of this remains and we can only kind of presume what is what material they use. However, when you read a little later in time, when you read, uh, uh, you know, texts from that period, Arthashastra, for example, you come across the names of ornaments. There are references to thousand strand necklaces, 90 strand necklaces, Indra Chanda, Vijay Chanda, beautiful descrip descriptions of the ornament forms in the Arthashastra. And when you correlate it with some of these sculptures, then you realize that these were actual jewels. They were not figments of the uh, sculptor's imagination. Next. So now we're going to jump back uh, a good 2000 years forward uh, to the 18th, 19th century, back to when around the time the canvases around you were created. Um, let me take you to Calcutta in the middle of the 18th century. Um, um, and you, it's a non, there's a large map, um, two rooms down, which you can see after we finish speaking. But this is really to give you an idea of where this art was created. You see the river Hooghly um, flowing across the screen and uh, the little green uh, bit that you see is the new town that the British and the settlers really were um, crafting. Uh, all around you see the settlement and the city of Calcutta springing up. Just to give you an idea, at the time that we are looking at of when this art was created, there were um, there were all sorts of uh, the the. Uh, Population was divided up into almost a lakh and a half uh, Hindus. There were around 60,000 Muslims. Uh, this is from a contemporary source. And, and uh, rounding them off was a sprinkling of Jews, of Armenians, French, around 3,000 each. Um, there were also what, what was just dismissed as the lower caste, comprising of around 20,000 in number. And all of them was, uh, were settled in this great city known as Calcutta, today known as Kolkata. Uh, around the time that the, after the Battle of Plassey, I'm not getting into a history lesson, but as the British came and it, the new settlements grew very firmly into what was known as a European settlement, uh, we see the uh, springing up of architecture that was comparable with the best in Europe at the time. Next slide, please. And so you have these um, cities that are being built by the Westerners um, as a nostalgia and a firm determination to recreate what was in their cities back in England as well as in um, other parts of Europe. Wide avenues were laid. Calcutta, um, for those of you familiar with the city, um, had at its heart a huge uh, maidan. Uh, alongside the river, uh, which was the center point for shipping, were uh, shops that would bring in materials, uh, exchange of both cultures, languages, as well as goods was taking place. And um, I have a, a small quote from, from the time where, this, where one of the contemporary writers writes that Chorangi is a paradise, one of those localities that every person desires to live in. The road on the eastern side has many colonnaded mansions in the Grecian style, which have indeed a fine effect when viewed from the river. But it also has in the very front of it a cluster of miserable, and I quote, native huts tenanted by some 200 natives. 
And um, the, the reference really was also, next slide please, the reference was also to what was uh, referred to as the um, black town. So there was the white town where the European settlers were living in these well-planned areas, but there was of course also the harsh reality of uh, people who were living in the fringes, uh, bringing and going back into what Usha just said, to the terracotta temples that were in the fringe of the city, traditions and cultures of uh, both artistry and craftsmanship that were already connected back in time. Uh, what you see here are is it's a mid 19th century uh, photograph um, of the terracotta temples. Many of these um, early settlers in the city took photographs as well as sketches and sent them back. Today, sprinkled in collections across the world. In this collection here also, we have, as you go around, some of the artworks have notations alongside where the Britishers or the acquirers are writing um, on the margins what really was described in it. So this was really an attempt to understand a new culture. Next, please. And um, we now plunge into what you're all here to hear about, which is the uh, early Bengal art. We are, or this show really um, attempts to look at the genre of Patachitra paintings, and, uh, or pat paintings as we call in English. And Pata really means um, cloth, and Chitra, as you know, is, is painting or, or a depiction of a visual idiom. And together, these paintings were, of course, around forever. Um, they, they clustered around the temple towns in the fringes of Calcutta. But with the coming of new peoples, with the coming of uh, new customers, uh, the, this visual idiom played out in, um, in, a, in a way that is exhibited around you. Contrasted in this show, together with the Patachitra paintings, is also lithographs and oil paintings from the same genre, as well as reverse glass paintings that will help you understand really what was, in essence, a traditional art form. The traditional art form itself looked at traditional iconography of gods, goddesses. Um, those of you familiar with Hindu art would know. Next slide, please. We'll look at them. They were looking at, um, um, at, at traditional um, iconography, really. So on the right is a picture from this show, which is really a Ram Darbar. So that's Lord Rama, um, unrecognizable um, today's, in today's iconography. On the left with his um, um, wife and his brother Lakshman holding a parasol. I contrast it with a, a print from the early 20th century from the Ravi Varma Press, which shows the same theme. And you'll see really it's the same iconography, but how one, one bit is, you know, very identifiable and familiar to us. And on the right is how the um, painters made it. As we talk and look at the themes, I'm also going to ask Usha to jump in and, and, and um, talk to us about both the attire and the jewelry. Usha? Yeah. So where Deepthi left off about Calcutta, um, a few words about uh, uh, the region because uh, we, I have to tell you about Murshidabad because it was the original capital of Bengal. It was known as the city of silk. The road to Murshidabad, I mean, as Kishore mentioned in his uh, introduction with the decline of the Mughal Empire, artists sought patronage in the different courts of India and Murshidabad was one of the centers to which they gravitated. Hyderabad was another center to which they went, and we had the amazing work that they did um, in, in Hyderabad at that time. And of course, to a lot of the provincial courts, because at that time we see places like um, Jaipur and Baroda and all the other uh, kingdoms uh, coming to life, uh, the, the, the lust, and just to use that word, the lust for jewelry uh, shows up in all the, uh, the photographs of all the Maharajas uh, from the early 19th century onwards. So Murshidabad uh, was the capital and we know in, I mean, it, there are beautiful pieces that have survived from Murshidabad, especially after the Battle of Plassey in 1757 and, you know, Clive um, looted the Murshidabad treasury, a lot of those pieces are now scattered around the world. Now, where did uh, the, the, this craze for gold uh, happen in Bengal? And we'll come to that later. But as far as these images are concerned, Ravi Verma, 
of course, we know that he traveled a lot. He traveled around the country and he was uh, painting at that time when there was this big nationalist movement taking root in the country. So a lot of the Ravi Varma works of art, and I've seen, we have seen some beautiful Ravi Varma works right here at the DAG. Um, he almost made his uh, representation of jewelry in his paintings pan-Indian. So there are images of women, you know, wearing a nut from Maharashtra, for example, or, you know, of course, all his Kerala women, all his South Indian women. So he kind of brought all that into his paintings. Now, as far as Bengal is concerned, again, you start seeing things like the Sarpech and the Kalgi appearing in these works. You didn't see it in the um, Chandra Ketu Gar, for example. So they start coming in because what happened in the royal courts, every court in India was trying to model themselves on the old Mughal Empire, on the courts of Jahangir and Shah Jahan. A lot of these hair ornaments, uh, especially turban ornaments, were often given as Nazrana, gifted um, uh, as tokens of gratitude, expressions of loyalty. So you start seeing all those kind of works coming up uh, in these pictures. Now, importantly, who were these Chitrakars? Unlike the artists who moved from the Mughal courts and settled in these, these were a group of people by themselves, the Chitrakars, the Patuas. Uh, they belonged to the Vishwakarma community. Uh, you know, Lord Vishwakarma is the, the, the builder of the temples of the gods. Um, so he's kind of uh, it's a kind of a separate community, a separate artisan community. They include goldsmiths, uh, the painters, the blacksmiths, they all come together. And significantly, they all lived and worked together and they were often feeding off one another. So they kind of, you know, the, this is a community that comprised largely of Hindus and Muslims. And strangely, in Bengal, a lot of the Hindus took Muslim names and a lot of the Muslim artists took Hindu names. It was kind of, they kind of crossed uh, boundaries. There were no boundaries between them. I'd yeah. like you also to look at how Hanuman on the <clears throat> left is highly stylized, almost man-like. But for the humble uh, um, artist on the literally making it on the streets had to reference the langur which he probably saw on the tree um, and so on. Notice also how by this time into art creeps furniture that is now raised. Uh, you'll see the claw feet, you'll see, um, especially in the Ravi Varma, of course, it's almost a palace setting. There's carpets and uh, uh, fancy silks. But for the Bengal art on the right, you al also already see the, uh, in the coming in of raised furniture and the like. Next, please. I think one thing that struck me also was that uh, I'd like uh, in other parts of India, Ram and Lakshman always have a moustache in Bengal paintings. I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> it's something that we discussed extensively, but it's there. It's kind of a recurrent motive in Bengal. Yeah. All the gods have moustaches. All Watch of them have that as you go along yeah. and, and all around <laughs> you. Usha and I scratched our heads, but we couldn't figure that one out. Um, and, and, and of course, also the headgear. This is on the left is a painting from the Peabody SX. And you see, that's of course, um, our friend Raja Ram Mohan Roy. But you also see uh, a fluidity of textual, uh, of, um, of um, uh, attire, headgear also seeping into this art. Next, please. Um, we move now to the goddesses. We're just introducing you to the themes that were, um, that you see in this uh, genre of art. Uh, Calcutta, the goddess Durga, and her many avatars, they're synonymous. And we'll be looking at uh, the feminine energy and how she's depicted. But um, see, in this painting, you'll see this is the goddess Jagadatri, um, a, a form of the uh, uh, Durga divine. Um, she sits on the lion, but, as you, but in the iconography, the lion in turn is vanquishing the, um, an elephant. The elephant, as, as storytelling goes, is a marker of ahimsa. It's the conquering of the ego. Um, it's basically, you know, you're supposed to imbibe a good from this picture. Uh, but you'll also see by now how profusely, um, Usha, the jewelry 
Yeah, so one thing you see in, you know, all Indian miniature paintings, with very, very rare exceptions, as well as in all the works of art that you see around here is that the jewelry is very, very standardized. It's kind of repetitive from one work of art to the other. It's almost as though they were following a formulae for the representation of jewelry. So uh, the goddess always had a, a mukut, um, you know, a kind of a crown that she wore, uh, multiple earrings on her ears, this many, many strand necklace around her neck, armbands, bracelets, anklets. They're pretty much repetitive, which is to, you know, take us back to what I said. These were people, uh, the Chitrakars, they worked as a community. And, and therefore, obviously, you know, they had kind of established some kind of a standardization uh, between them that if it is Durga, it is to be represented this way. This was the kind of jewelry. A little later on this evening, you will see where I think they got their influence from because these were not only people who were stuck in one part or in one village, they were actually traveling performing artists. So they were the storytellers. They were not only the painters, they were also the storytellers. So they would paint these patwas, uh, these pats, and then travel from village to village uh, telling the story, the, the myths and the legends uh, that they represented uh, in their painting. And their area of travel extended, uh, was quite vast, you know, right from uh, Orissa uh, through Bengal up into the Northeastern states, especially places like Meghalaya and Tripura. Yeah. We move on. I mentioned earlier that while we are looking at uh, part paintings, we are also, we're also introducing you to uh, contemporary visual documentation and other forms. So in front of you is the goddess Kali. On the right as a, a photograph that was taken inside the temple and on the left as a, a lithograph. And you will see almost immediately how the visual representation uh, runs uh, fairly standardized and we're we going to look at the paintings uh, uh, a little further on. Uh, but notice how the iconography between the, um, in, in both, both mediums where she holds a severed head in her hand and whether it is the holding of the, the protruding tongue, it's the fierce form of Durga, um, this becomes almost standardized. Next please. So, you know, there are rare moments, rare eureka moments in, in the life of a jewelry historian. <laughs> and as I said, you know, these are so, so standardized. The earring on the left, known as Khan, uh, is in the Amrapali collection in Jaipur. Uh, I'm in the process of writing the catalog of that collection. And when I looked at those earrings, you know, it kind of just befuddled me, you know, which part of the country is it from? Uh, I couldn't place it because I'd never seen one like that before. And then when we were looking through uh, the DAG catalog, we came across this painting and look at the paint, uh, look at the earrings that Kali is wearing. They are absolutely identical to the Khan that you see on the right. And therefore, you know, it kind of is, is an amazing uh, moment for me because I'm able to place the piece of jewelry in an art historical context, that doesn't happen too often. So the earring is made of silver and the Khan actually, earrings that cover the entire year is very, very popular in Bengal. It has evolved. But what is important to note is, you must remember that these are not royal jewels. Um, what these Patuas and the Chitrakars were looking at was uh, the jewelry in their environment, what were their women wearing, what were the villagers wearing, what were the dancers who were, you know, performing uh, the stories and the legends, what is it that they were wearing, native dance forms, folk dancers, uh, we'll come across some of the other dance forms. Next so please. here is a lovely match. Yeah, I should take this also. So this is, uh, you know, uh, a little bit about shola pith. I mean, again, that is a material that is very, very particular to Bengal. Uh, shola pith is, uh, is almost like a substitute for ivory. It's a white, soft, 
pulpy material. It's from an aquatic plant um, that uh, is found in the marshy lands in Bengal, in that Hooghly Delta area. And uh, these plants are harvested, they're dried, and then they are carved into jewelry. So during Durga Puja, for example, all the jewels traditionally I'm talking, of course, things have changed today. All the jewels that would adorn the goddess was made of shola pit. And even today, I think next picture, next, yeah. The topor and the mukot, something that a Bengali bridegroom and bride compulsorily wears on their wedding is made from that shola pit. There's a lot of uh, symbolic significance to it. Uh, the topor, the male ornament is called a topor and the female one is known as a mukot. Consists of seven layers, seven uh, steps uh, supposed to symbolize uh, and always topped with a bird, the bird on top. It's supposed to connect the groom on that day to the sun god, kind of invoke the blessings of the sun god, which is why the bridegroom wears energized by the sun god. And of course the mukut, uh, again, the sholapith has got, you know, symbolism of purity because of the white, symbolism of fertility because it grows in such abundance in the marshy lands. Uh, symbolism of longevity because it actually lasts a lot. I mean, it doesn't kind of break up and it uh, endures. Yeah, yeah. Just to, so this this lovely piece is actually from um, a collection not far from where we are sitting. This is a, from the CSMBS Museum. It's um, it's in the corridor, so nobody really looks at it much. But it's actually a fabulous piece. The theme is that of uh, Mahishasura Mardini, where uh, Mahishasura or the demon. Uh, the bull demon is being vanquished by the goddess. So she holds a spear that is piercing through the um, Asura's um, heart. And um, I, I kind of like how the animation is shown. The first, you know, this is how it, a method used in miniature painting and here in sculpture, where you see the Asura being pierced and then flops down with the little tongue sticking out. Um, and, and of course, the lion on the side. Next, please. Next, please. And uh, yeah, Usha. So, or, as I said earlier, you know, these were traveling chitrakars. They were traveling performing artists. So where did all these influences come from? For example, look at the mukut that uh, the deity is wearing in this particular painting. To me, it's obvious that it came from Meghalai, from the Khasi. And you can see an example. The one on the top is made of shola pit. And the one at the bottom is made of silver. It's worn on all their special occasions uh, during uh, ceremonies, uh, during the time of the festivals and, and all their dances. So it's obvious. I mean, I, I think the influence came from there. And if you see the painting itself, when you see it against the light, you will see what shows up as gray on the, on the screen in front of you is actually a silver. This was, of course, used, it was a, a technique used by the artists where they would use, um, um, it, it's, a, it's a form of metal, a decorative raised element, and you see it very beautifully in the room next to you. But what's really interesting as we were talking was that what was shown in silver on the painting actually also existed as a, as a silver ornament. Next, please. More examples of the mukut. The mukut. You know, Alpana is such a uh, traditional Bengal uh, art form. You know, they decorate uh, the Alpana on the on the ground, and as well as uh, you know, when the uh, for the bride on her face. So you see a lot of those Alpana designs coming out in the jewelry, and and likewise into the paintings of the Mukut. Next, please. So this is really an example, um, um, and if you look at it, it's um, it's drawn from all the art that is in these rooms um, that surround you. But in every image, you will see what Usha said, a similarity of the mukut, of the head uh, ornament, at the same time, the variations as they transcend various mediums. So in front of you is a collection of uh, mediums as they are, uh, ranging from oil paintings, patachitra paintings, uh, reverse glass enamel paintings, which is the bottom row, uh, lithographs, influences drawn from 
both Indian miniature paintings as well as the Western influences that were creeping in. So if you look at the second last row extreme right, you almost see it's very Christian, um, um, a drawing from Christian iconography and how the face was shown. Next, you know, please. we see a lot of these yeah. miniatures of, uh, especially during the company school period of uh, people like Nojahan and Mumtaz Mahal, uh, you know, painted on ivory. Ivory plaques. Yeah, yeah, ivory plaques. So it's very much like that. So these were actually circulating. We must always remember that there was nothing that was, uh, the borders were open and there was a lot of movement at the time. We're talking jewelry, so we decided to um, focus on some gory jewelry. <laughs> In front of you um, are three paintings, uh, two of which are uh, drawn from the collection. Um, on the extreme right is a painting drawn from the National Museum in Delhi. The theme is the same. Uh, the, the, for those of you unfamiliar with the iconography, this is um, um, the goddess Kali in her most ferocious um, uh, terrible avatar of form. Uh, the story goes that, uh, as usual, it's a fight between the good and the bad. Uh, there was the um, Asura Raktabija who was given the, um, uh, the, the boon that every drop in battle, very useful in battles, every drop of blood, uh, drop of blood that fell from his body would propagate and create thousand more forms of him. Um, in the in the proverbial fight between the gods and the demons, obviously the gods were losing, and the demons, with every drop that fell, were multiplying by the thousands. So the gods are puzzled, and they go um, where else but to a woman for help. So they go to goddess Durga and say, "You must help us." And she comes and she starts fighting, but she realizes very soon the problem because there were so many demons and only one of her, and she takes on. Um, the form that you see in front of her of Kali, the most ferocious, and she, um, I, I speed up the story, she cuts off the demon's head and drinks the entire blood in one go, one go, and then flings his corpse. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's the, that's the story and the iconography we are looking, but it doesn't end there. Um, so, so incensed is she with her power and her energy that she continues her divine dance. Um, landing up on the actually on her husband Shiva, whom you see um, supine on the on the ground. Um, next, please. But we are talking about jewelry, and um, we look at this early form where you see Kali and um, and in her destructive avatar, the the um, hymns and prose uh, prose and the textual references that describe her in the Puranic texts describe her as extremely ferocious, she's shrieking, she's night itself, everything uh, dark, jackals um, um, accompany her, owl, which the owls and the shrieking animals that are creatures of the night accompany her. So it's a very, very vivid negative imagery. But nonetheless, if you see here as jewelry, you'll see uh, her earrings are um, Human forms. Human yeah. corpses. Yeah. Her necklace, if you see, is also a... a, 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 a in this case, a necklace of... Uh, necklace A is skulls and necklace B is just, again, strung men around her neck. Her belt is actually, um, again, severed body parts, arms in this case of people she's killed. So you can see there's a lot going on here. And if, if that's not enough, there are dead bodies being barbecued at the back and all of that. Next, please. But you see, and, and, and our attempt really is to show how that early imagery then evolves. Um, in, in, the, in the next version, you see things are a little better, gory still. A uh, uh, belt of um, arms, severed arms is still intact. Around her neck is again still skulls. There is a nimbus now. She doesn't look as ferocious. The um, decapitated head is still in her hand. Uh, but you can see the fierce animals are um, a little muted now. Next, please. And by the time we come to this version, this, you know, she's just almost looking uh, benevolent. Uh, the, the gory parts as iconography persist, but except for the Munda Mala or the Skull Mala, there's uh, very little that uh, remains from the first version that we saw. Usha? Yeah. 
So, you know, by the time um, the oil paintings start, it was also a time when a lot of the European artists uh, were floating around the country at that time. And Bengal, uh, we know, for example, that the British established their first factory in Chandranagar in Bengal. The Portuguese were in Bengal. The Dutch were there. So there were a lot of these influences that the Chitrakars uh, the old traditional Chitrakars were exposed to. There was a lot of, lot of these art schools uh, that were being set up and uh, artists were coming out of these uh, schools trained in the British idiom of painting, of looking at things. So you start seeing a greater degree of formalization and as, you know, the previous one we saw, even though she's wearing a waist belt of those arms, it becomes much more stylized. It, it's not obviously, you have to really look at it in comparison with the painting with all the arms hanging around her waist and you realize here it's kind of more subdued and more stylized. Yeah, and the jewelry now has tassels which we'll come back to later. Next please. Yes. Next. So um, I put this picture in. Um, it's, it's a Basoli painting. Uh, I grew up in Calcutta. And uh, my earliest years were spent in Calcutta. It was the first language I spoke was Bengali. And the very, very fond memories I have is of Mahalai Amavasya. At 4.30, 4 o'clock in the morning when my mother would wake me up. And we would listen to Birendra Kumar Bhadra's rendition of the Chandi part. Even today you can hear it at 4.30 in the morning being played. Um, of course, now you can hear it even on Spotify. Uh, I would advise, I would request all of you to hear it because it's a sublime experience just to hear his rendition of the Chandi part. Now what is important in the Chandi part is that Durga Mahishasura Mardini comes, is awakened to destroy evil as uh, Deepthi explained. And what the Chandi part says is Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva came to Durga because they found that they could not, they did not have the strength and the ability to destroy Mahisha and they needed the help of Durga. They come to Durga and they give her their weapons, you know, the conch, the spear, the trishul is all given to her. But the weapons are not enough to empower Durga. So what she needed was jewelry. So you can see on the right that the milk cushion gave her a pure necklace, a pair of undecaying garments, a divine crest jewel for her head, a pair of earrings, bracelets, a brilliant half moon ornament, armlets on all her arms, a pair of shining anklets, a unique necklace, and excellent rings on all the fingers. And only then did she transform from the invisible nir nirguna form to the powerful visible saguna form and destroyed Mahisha. And so jewelry was so integral uh, to the power that she needed to get. And I think that still continues, right? Any woman continues. will tell you that yes. a bit of jewelry And power yourself with jewelry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so for um, all the men in the room, now you know why women wear diamonds. <laughs> the gods themselves vouch for it. Next, please. So we, uh, we, we, we go on now, we sidestep. We are looking now at um, an oil painting. You have the goddess Parvati sitting with um, her son Ganesha. And you see by now, if you look at the attendant figures at the back, um, a, a beautiful radiant golden nimbus. But if you look at the attendants, you'll see their costume has again changed. So these patuas were actually drawing from influences. You must remember this was a time in the late 19th century um, there were postcards available in the city that they were. There were lithographs, there were posters. There was an abundance of visual referencing. And because they were not draw in, a, in a royal court, because they were really catering to the demands, they could draw and they would, uh, as all true artists do, lean into the creativity of what they saw around them. So you see here, for example, garments that are um, today would be just called from the, the modern state of Rajasthan. You have an old knee and you have uh, the jewelry is also uh, similar. Again, uh, please notice the raised platform. It's almost in a European, Indo-Western kind of a, a, a takat, um, the jewelry. 
Sure. So again, we try to see, you know, uh, what is the continuity of jewelry styles because designs and forms also evolved. And one of the recurring pieces of jewelry that you will see in so many of these paintings is the four arm ornament, the, the kind of the arm uh, ornament that is worn with four chains. And, you know, one presumes that it has gone completely out of fashion and it has vanished until you come across something like a mantasha, which is a, again a very, very typical Bengal jewel. Today, of course, it's been, uh, you know, remodeled not to be worn as a forearm ornament, but more as a bracelet. But if you connect it with what uh, the goddess is wearing, Parvati is wearing on her forearm, uh, you obviously know that the mantasha is an evolution of that form. Uh, earlier, Deepi spoke about the colloidal tin, you know, if you look at the, the, the silver uh, paint, the rung that they used. Uh, that became very, very expensive, uh, was not freely available after a while and therefore the artist then had to resort to creating um, almost a three-dimensional representation of jewellery by using uh, the opaque watercolour in the form of dots. dots. And you see that also, you know, in other paintings, for example, in Kangra and Basoli, they started using beetle wings. Um, in the paintings, again, to uh, simulate emeralds. Uh, so you see this kind of thing happening across the country. And give a iridescence. Next, please. Um, here it's very evident, by, if you look at this, so this painting was created in Bengal, but if you look at it, you'll very clearly see the references of, uh, um, of a costume that is not Bengal at all. Um, what Usha just said, look at the transparency uh, created uh, with the old knees or the veils that go over the head and just with the simple stippling or the dot uh, treatment that's given, you get a sense of these transparent um, upper garments that these women will wear. And of course, at the center of the all of it is Krishna with his ladies. Next, please. Um, yeah. So again, you know, where are these influences coming from? As I said, they traveled. So look closely at the earrings, you know, these round uh, hoops that if you look closely at all the pictures in the gallery, you'll see that practically every image of the goddess wears these round hoops. Extremely, I don't like to use the word tribal, but more, you know, the, the uh, ethnic uh, forms that come, for example, um, in the Bonda woman on the right, who's wearing almost identical hoops. So these were the artists who were taking these jewelry from from around them, what they saw, what they liked, perhaps the movement when they danced attracted them and they brought those into the painting. Next, please. Similarly, you know, we always, I, we have heard of Panch Lada, Sat Lada, Nau Lada, but I've never heard of hundreds of Ladas except in, in the Arthashastra of Kautilya who speaks about a necklace of 1,008 strands. And then when you look at the uh, Bonda woman or the Santal woman, you see the bead necklaces that she's wearing. It almost kind of replaces the garment. It covers her from neck right down almost to her knees. And, you know, the I yellow know. that you see is yeah. actually all beads on the extreme left. And the, um, a topic for another lecture, which Usha is brilliant at, is about beads. But that's for another <laughs> time. Uh, and And... You see in the painting, of course, um, what I mentioned earlier about notations. Yeah, in this example, you see uh, in cursive at the bottom is written a beautiful lady sitting on a lotus. Um, she is the goddess of riches, which is nice. Um, but she is, of course, you see, um, uh, for, for those of you in the room, you are familiar with this iconography. Um, and uh, the uh, goddess seated. And here, of course, we are looking at her necklaces with the parallel examples. Okay. <laughs> it's cricket time. Next, please. <laughs> um, the goddess Ganga. And again, you know, we, I, we started this, uh, the, the, this conversation with a reference to terracotta imagery. On the uh, left is a Gupta terracotta image from the 5th century. And you will see how, how you know, the, the back and forth, you're looking at something from the 5th century and then you're looking at something from the 19th century and you will see how pleats 
or the drapery is shown similarly both in the sari as well as on the uh, terracotta garment on the left goddess ganga was uh, always shown on her vahana which is the makara uh, uh, a salt fresh water dolphin if you will we presume now extinct and um, and you'll see in the national museum version the head is broken off but you see the similarity of the iconography and of course the ubiquitous uh, parasol for uh, the goddess ganga is always shown with a kalasha or a pot but in the bengal version the pot seems to have uh, kind of disappeared but uh, and taken on more iconography from the local uh, idioms of the uh, goddess durga you know many of these artists uh, we can go to the next, next. one many of these uh, painters were also jewelry designers and we have come across i have come across the names of uh, many such uh, in different parts of the country uh, you can see it immediately uh, you know in in the great attention to detail in the great amount of uh, uh, focus that is given to the jewelry you start seeing individual jewelry forms and therefore it's obvious you know a lot of them they were designers primarily they were designers they were artists they were also sculptors so within a family uh, there could be one person who was the painter the chitrakar uh, his brother could be the goldsmith the sonar uh, somebody else in the family could have been a sculptor uh, could have been a person who carved the idols, uh, the Sholapit idols for Durga Puja. So these were close-knit family units who often fed off each other and you see these influences in the paintings. Yeah, so I, I pointed out earlier in the paintings when Usha and I were looking at the art together, we see this extremely elaborate um, um, detailing of tassels from the of the ornaments and you will see here uh, both in the photograph the photograph is of a dancer of the uh, manipuri uh, nuts and kirtan um, and you will see the in the photograph it's very clearly visible of these tassels that are um, you can see very clearly um, you will also see on the photograph on the right the same tassel so you see it is I would say 90% of the time it is fairly safe to presume in Indian art that what is shown is almost always reference from real life. And time and time again we have found without fail that you will be confused about something but eventually if you look hard enough you will find that it is actually drawn from um, real objects or real jewelry. I mean even the figures on the left you know they, they are not static, they are not standing straight. You can see almost the same posture as in the dance. Uh, the Manipuri dancer on the right. And of course the peacock feathers on the head. Next please. So the, you know, these Ladas uh, which are popular right from uh, almost the entire expanse of North India, extremely popular in, in Rajasthan, um, makes its appearance in Bengal. Um, and then we know, for example, the, the, the multiple Ladas where the influence probably came from. So this is an example. And I hope by this slide you're kind of seeing everything come together. You're seeing the forearm on ornaments, you're seeing the uh, peacock mukut on the head and, and through just jewellery and attire you're able to read uh, this painting a little better. Um, next please. Um, again a detail. And the, my, my, the, the, what I referred to earlier, the notation which says Bulo Ram, which is Balram, um, brother to Krishna, simple. And we are, of course, drawing your attention to the anklet, which is actually, although the painting is from the east, the anklet is from all the way across the subcontinent on the western part from Gujarat. Next, please. And drawn again from the paintings in this gallery, a reference to the absolutely myriad ways in which anklets are worn. All of them in some form and in some part of India still extant, still available. So we know, um, you know, uh, during uh, the early, late 19th and the early, early 20th century, there were a lot of these um, India exhibitions, great Indian exhibitions held. Uh, in London and in Paris at that time, a lot of these people uh, uh, acquired jewelry from India and Bengal was one of the regions that was 
extensively represented. It was the British presidency, it was the British capital of their empire in India. So the next few slides that show a collection of jewels was acquired uh, from these exhibitions today in the Victoria and Albert Museum. So, and all of them from Bengal. Please next, notice yeah. that they're all strung on um, uh, cloth strings or cloth ropes. Um, it's a very common form for those of you who may have similar pieces, but they're essentially individual metal parts that are strung on um, very versatile, your, you know. Yeah. Your These are all jasmine buds. Jasmine this, buds, yeah. which we see in other parts of India as well. Next, please. So, again, the uh, Bengal, even today, special, you, you know, the greatest craftsmen, the finest jewelers come from Bengal. In fact, they are employed all over the country. If they ask you, you know, you say immediately, is he a Bengali Babu? Because he was, he is the most skilled goldsmith, he's the most skilled gem setter. They also have uh, the skill to work a very, very small amount of gold, uh, beat it into a very thin, fine sheet, and then work in repuse, embellish it with gemstones. Uh, I think there are only two parts of the country today that has this kind of skill. One is Bengal, and the other, of course, is Kerala where they can transform a single one gram of gold into something that looks extremely uh, expensive. Expensive, yeah. <laughs> a little goes so, a long way. So bangles like this, you know, one of the very, very popular forms is the Makhar Mukhi Kada in, in Bengal. Even today, it's very popular. The antiquity of this uh, form with, you know, animal head terminals, whether it's tigers or elephants, goes back to Gandhara times. Uh, I think a lot of this also speaks about the extremely vibrant trade across uh, country. I mean, today we are talking about geographical boundaries, but in those days there were no such geographical boundaries. So there was such a free movement of ideas and goods and people across a vast expanse. So items that are man were manufactured in Bengal, for example, were taken and sold in, a, in Hyderabad. We know uh, from Rajasthan or from Haryana even, jewelers were actually flocking to the Nizam's court uh, or some of them were migrating and settling down in Hyderabad. So a lot of these cross-cultural influences were happening. Okay, now for the show, um, it's called Babu and the Bazaar. And uh, we spoke about the Babus um, who were the patrons for a lot of this art. But we move now to uh, another uh, rather interesting part. Next, please. Um, the patwas also, like I said earlier, were catering to demand. And um, one of the forms that uh, was extremely popular as a souvenir or a takeaway were these uh, uh, slightly racy, uh, sometimes erotic paintings that were just looking at this changing social structure. So here in a series, you see a woman waiting, stringing garlands, which is a, a, a very old idiom of, um, of a woman waiting for her lover, stringing, stringing um, um, flowers. You see it in Ravi Varma paintings and so on. And then her uh, lover comes with a rose. Um, um, they get cozy and, and then uh, um, more cozy and then more cozy yet. And then finally, the image that I said where everything's done and she's just getting back into her clothes. Uh, but what I want you to um, uh, look at is that uh, the woman is actually wearing a white sari with a black border. This was actually, and there's a very sad underlying footnote to this, is that there were also at the margins of the society um, a lot of um, Bengal at the time, widows who would, who the, the standard uniform for the widow was a white sari with a black border. And many of them were actually forced into prostitution or really serving the babus. Um, so there's also a, a, a hidden element of satire in this kind of art that was being um, uh, passed around. I think you can also see, you know, the, the reduced number of ornamentation on these women as, nice, as compared to the they're other They're not really wealthy we women, yeah. Uh, the Babu, of course, had to, uh, his status had to be shown in the painting. So he is wearing uh, a mukut or, uh, you know, a turban ornament. So that kind of 
places him on a different pedestal. He was a Bhadralok, he was a Zamindar, he was rich. So he had that had to be shown somehow, the contrast between the rich Babu versus these women. Next. And so on, you see the exposed breasts and the kind of a thing. Next, please. Um, here again, overtones, what I just mentioned, overtones, a single shared garment, um, a suggestion really of um, erotic same-sex love, two women exchanging roses, and um, um, as Usha said, uh, uh, hip ornament as well as a bracelet. And flowers. Uh, she's wearing flower garlands around her ankle now. Yeah. Next. Um, this we thought was interesting, where you have on the extreme right one of the paintings that the Patuas uh, made. Uh, this is a woman woman at toilet, really exposed breast, looking at a... a Their right is that. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Ma, sorry. My sorry. right. You got it. I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about the photograph um, um, here. And, and the paintings that you see in the middle and... Far right. Now I'm confused. Yeah. Far right. Um, are both Jamini Roy paintings. Um, uh, so there is also really, we, we are talking about this genre, but into the 20th century, there is a thread of continuity. The forms that the Patuas were create, creating, in turn, then again, catapulted forward into styles that were uh, to endure. So if you look at this painting, it's hanging on the wall over there. It's fully, the, all the jewels are represented with this material we call colloidal tin. Absolutely sparkling silver. And what is striking is that Jamini Roy was obviously influenced by this painting, but chose to leave out all the jewelry. You know, it's completely devoid so of any So you bring it into yet another yeah. century. Next, please. Um, really a fun element. Uh, coming into here, we have a Babu and his babe. And you see, by this time, Calcutta has uh, um, um, the best of Victorian attire and accessories available. Victorian shows, I can't, I came today morning from Calcutta and I cannot imagine wearing these boots anywhere in India today, but it was stylish. I think the sari would have been comfortable, but Victorian shoes were flooded and available in the Victorian market. And you will see both men and women wearing these heeled um, shoes. We live in times of Hira Mandi, so there are other yeah. references. You can actually Next. see in a lot of the royal photographs of women, you know, these kind of shoes kind of peeping out from under their uh, saris. Yeah, yeah this, this is, is again. again. Next, Next please. please. Yes. Yes. So, we are bringing us to a close very abruptly. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before we kind of open this uh, to the audience for questions uh, and just to kind of place so much of what you've shared and that was really, really uh, wonderful, uh, the, that conversation between the two of you, uh, to try and understand clearly in the 18th and 19th century and because you come all the way to Jamini Roy, the whole idea of decorativeness, of excess, of a maximalization uh, almost of jewelry, etc. Uh, was that really a reflection of the times? Uh, that was one question. And the other, which I wanted to ask, again, you bring up the idea of patronage. I'm just trying to understand. One, you're talking about influences that are coming in from various parts of the country and finding a reflection within the paintings and whether these are uh, the uh, putt paintings or the oil paintings. Uh, so one is, the influence coming in, but there's also the idea of patronage and therefore creating art which is specially meant for uh, people who are going to take this away from homes. So a reflection of their desire to uh, find a reflection within the kind of clothes or within the jewelry that is being extended into the uh, paintings. Would you like to kind of just very briefly touch on these aspects? So we must also remember that it was at this time that, uh, you know, it was the heyday of the British Empire still in India. Um, so there were uh, a lot of the British jewellery firms were actually in India at that and time. And in Calcutta. And in Calcutta. Uh, for example, there was P. Orr and Sons. Uh, there was Marcus and Company. There was Hamilton and Company. Um, they were all uh, catering, manufacturing, not only for the local um, elite. expatriate elite population, but also to the local elite. 
lot of this stuff was also being made in India for export to England. Um, so patronage was there a lot. There were a lot. It was also because, uh, you know, the, the it what it's what happened in Russia after the revolution. You know, when when there was an abundance of jewelry that suddenly became available in the European market. With the pay, with the decline of the Mughal Empire, the Maharajas became the largest buyers um, of jewelry. So they were ordering these, they were commissioning this, and there was also this feeling. You know, they had to keep up. What was it that? Um, you know, how could they relate to their Western counterpart? Uh, it could only be done through, you know, their attire, their jewelry, because that kind of set them. They all, I suppose, imagined themselves as Queen Victoria. And we know, for example, that when the British actually looted Ranjit Singh's treasury, one of the biggest auctions of Ranjit Singh's treasures was held in Calcutta. Um, so a lot of these things were available in Calcutta at that and time. And by the time you come to the 20th century, you see them all as echoes of their Western counterparts. Everybody is dressing Western, wearing Western. Some of them shift completely into Western wear. So it's again that back and forth carries on. It does. Yeah. And you see it in film, you know, you look at the Satyajit Ray's films, then, you know, again, they it both Balika Bodhu, for example, when the young bride you look at a Ray film, some of those early films, just to see those beautiful women and all the jewelry that they used to wear. So he kind of also took from these influences as to what it was. And today, I mean, even today in Bengal, that whole Zamindari culture is very, very strong. The bodies are all very, very much alive in Bengal today. Uh, I was asking in the context that a lot of this art that we're seeing, of course, comes from Bengal and it's been sourced from Bengal. You don't see this art per se in uh, in the palaces in Gujarat and in uh, Rajasthan. So uh, my presumption is that this uh, uh, the patronage is local in terms of the art now, not the jewelry, etc. In Bengal, among the zamindars, uh, of course, the local zamindars, and that's where you see them wearing saris and stuff. And then the Gagra Sholis, etc., coming in with the merchants who've come in from Gujarat and uh, Bengal and settled in Calcutta and the surrounding region. But I think some patronage continued. So if you take all the temple towns, you take Nadwara mm. or you take Tanjore down south, in all of these places where literally money or wealth was available, souvenirs as art were also available. By the time late 19th, early 20th, this transcends into like painted photography. So it takes myriad forms, but variations of it exist nowhere as profuse perhaps as Bengal because it was one of the early capitals. And I also think the subject matter, you know, Durga is at the forefront of this Bengal art and Durga is the patron goddess of Bengal. You don't see this kind of uh, worship of Durga, the manner in which Durga is worshipped with the Durga Puja and that nine day celebration in other parts of the country. Because again, this is a very Shaivite tradition, whereas the, the, the strength of Vaishnavism in is Gujarat, elsewhere. for example, is much stronger. So also male versus female. Thank you very much for pointing that out. <laughs>